I'm a follower and a fan and have done my best in my coaching to institute some of many of the concepts, especially Infinite Game, especially Just Cause. The way I want to approach this on behalf of this audience and even myself is with genuine curiosity about the gaps that I'm still struggling with of how to take these concepts and bring them into a reality. And I think one of the first things that could cause some folks to bristle is if I were to ask the people out here, how many of you consider yourselves extremely competitive and, and winners? How many of you would, would get on board with that? I think this is a, an identity that so many of these high achievers have adopted. So the moment that you're talking about not being in that, you know, winning, being first, these, these concepts as what's driving and it's the wrong conversation, how do you reconcile that for our leaders who have had so much success already? Well, let's be clear, I'm competitive. I am um, a type personality. My personality probably is very similar to the, 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 the people in this room. Well, not in this room, but in this space. Um, uh, um, it's not necessarily about uh, uh, being competitive or not being competitive. It's about knowing the game that you're in when you're in it. So for example, if you're up for a job and somebody else is up for a job, that is finite. There's a beginning, middle, and end, and there will be a winner and there will be a loser, and you should have a finite mindset in, in that scenario. Of course, you, you play to win. However, everybody knows that you have to have a little bit of an infinite mindset in the back of your mind. Um, for example, uh, uh, a gate agent in, a, in an airline. We want them to have a finite mindset. We want that plane to leave on time, beginning, middle, and end, done, reset. But we want them to have an infinite mindset. We want them to treat us nicely because they want us to come back again. Mm -hmm. It's not just one and done. We want to we we treat our clients with respect. It's not just about doing a good job and getting out of there. There is actually good customer service so that we get hired again or recommended. In other words, we have a sense that there's more beyond right now. But it's more about when you think about the business at, 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 at writ large, right? The, there is competition in an infinite game. The, the truest competitor in an infinite game is yourself, right? To say I'm the best X you know, in, in the industry is nonsense because you don't know everybody else. And some people are better at some things and some people are better at others. It's actually a stupid comparison. It's a stupid thing to say. It's, it's, it's empirically not true. Um, but you can strive to be a better version of yourself. How do I do better this year than I did last year? How do I improve my service this year, make it better than it was last year? How do I make my leadership better this year than it was last year? How do I improve my tech this year than it was last year? Whatever the thing is, there's always a constant and intense drive to win, uh, or, or to improve, rather. But when we say to, be, to win, uh, there is no such thing as a finish line. Even annual goals are arbitrary. Like, how do we come up with our annual goals? Here's how we do it. We sit down, we go, so uh, how much business do you want to do next year? How about this number? How about this number? OK. And that's it. That's how you pick your annual goal. And the reason we choose annual is because that's when we pay taxes. Why not, why not 17 months? That seems perfectly legitimate. It's all arbitrary. And so we become fixated about hitting an arbitrary number on an arbitrary date. We are so upset if we miss it, and we think we've won something when we hit it. It's nonsense. We have to change our mindset away from thinking of it like a sporting event and think of it more like lifestyle, right? Running a business is much more like trying to be healthy, right? So for example, what are all the things you have to do to be healthy? Well, you gotta eat right, you gotta exercise, you gotta nurse your personal relationships, you gotta get enough sleep. There's probably 15 other things. It's very hard to do all those things well all the time. What does it take to build a great business? You need great sales, you need great marketing, you need great leadership, you need great people, you actually gotta do the service. It's very hard to do all those things well all the time. But it's a striving, it's a striving, right? And you can absolutely have arbitrary goals, right? I wanna lose X amount of weight by X date. Okay. Great, and you weigh yourself every day, some days you feel good about yourself, some days you feel bad about yourself. We love metrics, there's nothing wrong with metrics. You can't run a marathon without mile markers. It's actually unnerving. Metrics help us feel like we're making progress. It makes feel like the work is actually uh, building something. Um, uh, and it, help us measure, it helps us measure speed and distance. That's what met metrics do, speed. And how far has our business gone? How fast are we growing? That's good, right? 
Um, and let's say you hit your goal. You, you, you lose that amount of weight on the right date. You feel great, you celebrate, and then you still have to keep exercising for the rest of your life. Like you haven't won anything, yeah. right? <laughs> but what's I think more interesting is what happens if you don't lose the weight by that, by that date? What happens if you miss the goal? Yeah. You know what happens? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing happens. In fact, you're way healthier now than you were when you started because you've been doing all the right things to be healthy. You just picked the wrong time and the wrong date, uh, the, wrong, uh, the wrong number on the wrong date. And you can clearly look at the trend that you'll hit it in a month or two. No big deal, right? And so business is the same way, which is what's more important in an infinite game is to see the trend data. So we, we, we do this all the time. We bonus people because they hit a goal and we ignore people because we ignored the trend. Right? But we don't know how they hit the goal or if it's going to be able to continue. What's way more important is the trend data because it means you're building a healthy business. You just picked the wrong date on the wrong time. So That's an infinite mindset. This is fabulous. And I, the piece that you just hit on, actually, this is really interesting because the, the person who first sent me the infinite game, the book, uh, to read it and, and made me aware of it was a business owner, one, a service titan client, Radiant Plumbing, Brad Casebier. And I've watched, yep, we've got Radiant, a couple of Radiant members right here, front and center, beautiful. And, and Brad Casebier uh, was the first CEO that I've seen who made it really clear. They, do, they have an incredible annual budget building process. And then I watched him r adjust the budget because we hadn't made enough hires to hit the number that we wanted yeah, to hit. That's correct. And, he, and, and, and you just said that's, I want you to hear that. He just said that's correct. So there, we have a long standing belief especially in this industry that I've witnessed, that you set the budget and the budget's the budget and you go get the budget yeah. by any means necessary. Uh, I mean, if you didn't learn a lesson from COVID, you know, my, my favorite thing when COVID hit, I used to get this question all the time, Simon, during these uncertain times, and I would always interrupt them and say, um, all times are uncertain. There's never been a time that was certain. All that happened was something that you didn't expect actually happened that reminded you that time was uncertain. Um, and so... You, you know, to be so dogmatic about a budget when we don't control anything, you know, the Marine Corps knows this. They, the Marine Corps has a, has, a, has a maxim, you know, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Well, I don't think any budget or any plan survives contact with reality, you know? Um, and, the rea and, and, and the fact of the matter is it changes. Now, that doesn't mean we should change it loosely, but we should be realistic. I'll give you a, 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 another way of thinking about it. Think of a retail operation, right? Uh, they have a goal, we're going to open 200 stores this year. But to your point, they're hiring so quickly and they're opening stores so, uh, uh, um, uh, to hit that goal that they're hiring the wrong people, they're not training them, and they end up opening bad stores. So they'll hit their goal, but then what happens the next year? And think about the problems that they're making for themselves. It's better to say we're going too quickly Growth is a dial, it's not an absolute. Let's open 20 stores properly, yeah. and then we'll worry about wh when we'll hit two. I'd rather you open 20 great stores than 200 bad stores, simply to hit a goal. And, and this is so meaningful because what our greatest, we, we know this, our greatest constraint, and, and truthfully more than most industries, is access to great technicians, licensed technicians, you know, bringing in wonderful people. And Brad's whole mentality with that is, why am I gonna work people harder than they need to burn them out to hit an arbitrary number at the risk of potentially losing them long term. And, and of course, this is inspired by very much, I mean, Hugh's an infinite minded leader before your book, but yeah. you know, through this, this piece. So remember, the goal of the infinite game is to stay in the game, right? Not to hit the goal this year. It's to stay in the game longer than anybody else. You outlast. That's the point. You build a strong, healthy business that can outlast. Fabulous. And, you know, I really, I think that's something that I've watched in hundreds and hundreds of businesses is the constant desire to go try to find new people, hire new people, grow, and a real lack of awareness and attention to the relationship and the experience that we're creating for our own people that we already have with us. And, and this is where your book has, has played such a major role, because one of the things that you talk about in there is discretionary effort the concept of people doing more than the bare minimum and being engaged in a just cause. So what I find is people tend to nod their head and go, yeah, just cause, that's exactly what we do. But they, they, 
not by the way that you've outlined it. So would you take a minute and just kind of distinguish between a vision, which I think a lot of our companies have, and what a just cause is, and what the distinction is here? The problem with the word vision is there's no standard definition. Right. Right? And to some people, a vision is actually a just cause, and they are synonymous. And to some people, a vision is um, a big long-term goal. And to some people, uh, a vision is something very selfish. Uh, you know, most visions are very poorly articulated, and they sound something like this, you know, to be the highest respected preeminent provider of X with the greatest possible value, you know, it's, they're, they're, that's what they most, mostly sound like. And that's all about you. Vision, just cause, and the reason I called it a just cause is because it's external. It's a cause so just that we would be willing to sacrifice in order to advance towards that cause. The Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. That's a just cause. Will we ever get there? No, we will not. Right. Will we die trying? That's the point. We will die trying. And so a vision is a world that we imagine. That's why we call it vision, because we should be able to see it. Like, I have a dream that one day little black children will hold hands on the playground with little white children. It's a vision. It's something that can be seen in the imagination. It is an ideal state of the world that we're striving towards. And so um, a business, um, a, a, a good business, generally does have a just cause, a vision of the future that may not have anything to do with the product or the service. You know, uh, my friend Bob Chapman, he uh, uh, runs a company called Barry Waymiller. It's a manufacturing company. They make large machines for industry. If you ask Bob, uh, uh, what's your vision for the company? He'll say, um, to build great people to do extraordinary things. And you'll say to Bob, well, how do you measure success then? He says, we measure success by how we touch the lives of our people. Hmm. In other words, his vision happens to be a vision for how to build the business, actually how to run the business, to build a business that is worth working for. It just so happens manufacturing is the manner in which they pay for that vision. Yeah. Um, uh, but it has nothing to do with the product. It doesn't have to. You know, Steve Jobs had a vision. He had a just cause to empower the individual to stand up to Big Brother. It just so happened he lived through the computer revolution, and the computer was the perfect tool to help in advance that vision. But it has nothing to do with the product. Is an idealized state of the world that you want to live in, and you commit your energy and your, and your business to help build that cause. So you're, you're starting to move us down in a nice segue here on this, but I have specifically wanted to ask you that. I've given so much thought to what would a just cause in the world of plumbing look like? What would a just cause sound like for an HVAC contractor or a pest control company? So you've alluded to it, but I'd, can you take us a little bit further? And I, I, I'll just leave it at that and then ask a follow-up. Well, first of all, a just cause is subjective and deeply personal. It can be whatever you want it to be, right? Uh, some are big and lofty, and some are not so big and lofty. It's, it's the thing that, that inspires you to get out of bed in the morning. And it doesn't even have to be unique. If you hear somebody else's, you're like, I like that one, then make that one your own. It's fine, right? Um, you know, we put a lot of pressure on people that you have to come up with your own vision. You don't. You have to find one that inspires you, but you don't have to you know, whether it's the Declaration of Independence or, or Civil Rights, you know, those weren't written, we didn't write those, but we follow them, you know? So, um, so something, it could be like, uh, some, um, it could be something simple, like uh, to live in a world in which every family um, uh, feels safe and taken care of. We happen to do it through uh, plumbing or HVAC, you know? And so when you say safe and taken care of, okay, that's gonna determine the quality of work you do. That's gonna determine what your uh, uh, um, invoicing process looks like and what your, your estimating process looks like. It's gonna be how you explain your product. It's gonna be the customer service. It's gonna have an impact that it's, you're building a business based on how people feel, right? And um, you want them to be taken care of not only by you, but that you're gonna install something in a way that they'll never have to see you again, you know? Um, the, I, was, I visited um, India, and uh, one of the guys out there, um, he's living in a brand new condo, you know, all new construction, and he's got a leak in his, in his brand new condo. And so he had some guy come and fix it. And about two or three weeks later, it was leaking again. And about two or three weeks later, it was leaking again. And I said, aren't you, 
a little bit annoyed that they're not fixing it right the first time. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. There's so many people in India, they can never fix it right the first time because then you'll have too much unemployment. Everything in India gets fixed not quite right so that they can come back and keep working. Right? There, there are people in this audience who have employed that strategy yeah, a lot. Yeah. Right? So. And, and we are lucky. We, we, we have enough work to go around. And I think one of the things that we forget is, especially in this industry, right, where t for the most part, I think most people view it as a commodity, you know? Mm. Um, and the problem with commodities is it's, you know, there are some that are great, there are some that are not so great, but, but I assume that most plumbers can fix my toilet. You know, I, I have that safe assumption that most electricians can, like, do some basic stuff, like installing new, you know, new, light bulb, new lighting fixtures. Right. Um, and so beyond that, that's why, we, that's why we push on price, because you're not offering me anything else, right? And so if you can think beyond that, in terms of the, how, 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 you, um, how you're creative in the service that you provide, um, it, are you listening to your customers uh, when they're talking to you? So let me give you a silly example, right? Let's say um, somebody comes in to, uh, I don't know, f f let's, let's take a plumbing example, whether it's a new install, you know, for a house that's being built, and you happen to meet the owners, and they talk about, you know, this is going to be our baby's room, and we're so excited. There's no plumbing in the baby's room, they're just showing you the house. And then you're done with your job, and when you're done, you leave a little baby gift to say, you know, good luck with your new home, as opposed to saying, I, I fixed all the plumbing. Right? The ability to listen to somebody that they feel seen and feel heard, I guarantee you, everybody they talk to won't talk about how great the taps work. They're going to talk about the little gift you gave to their kid when you were done, and they will recommend you to absolutely everyone. Yeah. And, and that's, it's the recommendation. We have a wallpaper guy that, uh, that comes to our house. I needed some wallpaper done. He didn't do paste. He was recommended to me by a friend. He came and he looked and he says, I can't do this job. And he gave me the name of somebody else, right? I, the guy came, he did a great job. And I said, I told him who recommended him. He said, oh, I've maybe, I met the guy once. He just heard I was good, I guess. The next time I had anything done, I immediately called the original guy because yeah. he was so honest. And so he's continued to do tons of work for our whole family because he's so honest. So, so this brings us to the point of of the disconnect, I think, sometimes in concept, because I can promise you, this, this audience here knows, you know, what you just spoke to, these aren't your typical contractors. Yeah. These folks get that. Yeah. They're doing extraordinary things, but there is still a real challenge, because as much as leadership and owners get it, there's a disparity in helping that just cause actually make it to the front lines. Yeah. And when we're paying CSRs at, you know, maybe hourly rates, customer service reps at hourly rates, we've got technicians that are in the field who are, you know, maybe not feeling particularly connected to the company. And I'm going to add another one. The, the, the wealth gap in our own industry is getting bigger than it's ever been before. Yep. Owners and business owners in our industry are seeing success like, like never before with the influx of private equity money and just general you know, businesses that are, are part of Service Titan. How do you get hourly employees, people who are maybe worried about you know, sure. paying rent, that are not high enough on Maslow's hierarchy of needs yet to think about fulfilling someone else's sure. dreams, to be part of a just cause and want to do more than just the bare minimum to survive. Well, this is the problem with vision. When you talk about, you know, when, you know the, the traditional vision, which is to be the best, you know, or to hit some certain financial goal, like literally the frontline person d doesn't care about that at all. That right. literally is about you, not me. Yeah. But when you, when you, um, when you say our, our, our and I, we'll go back to the arbitrary example I gave, you know, let's say to make everybody feel safe and cared for, right? That's what we care about. And so we're gonna actually give you training Beyond the technical skills, we're going to give you training in, how, in human skills, right? Because we give hard skill training. We very rarely give human skills training. By the way, I hate the term soft skills. Hard and soft are opposite. Yeah, good. Um, uh, and so are we actually teaching our frontline folks how to, how, to, um, how to have resolve conflict? I mean, that happens. You know, some, somebody says, I, I don't like this work you've done. How, how does that go? Do you have any idea how that conversation is going to go when you're not there? Right. You know, are we teaching them listening skills? 
are we teaching them how to give and receive feedback? Maybe they have there's two or three of them on a job and one of them is slightly more senior. Like, are we teaching them these skills that make them better at their job with each other and with the, with the customers? And by the way, those are skills they're taking home. You're making them better human beings. Um, and by making them better human beings, it makes them super loyal to the company. So I might get an offer to a better job somewhere else, and you know, there's, of course there are minimum standards of pay that they have to meet, but at the end, but there are, once you reach those thresholds, somebody can say, I, I'd rather work here because of the way that my boss makes me feel, because of the way the company makes me feel. And I think that there's a huge opportunity in this industry, in these industries, to double down on what, quite frankly, is good leadership. Um, uh, and I think one of the reasons that the, the, these industries are considered commodities is because we treat those workers as commodities. We treat them as, as replaceable hourly workers. And so they act like commodities and they treat uh, the customers like commodities. And we've created that commodity industry. It's not necessarily the product itself. This is so good because, you know, I'm thinking of the example you gave of the barista at the Four Seasons in, yeah. in, in the book, right? And he's a barista at two different places, and yep. one of them he loves and one of them he hates. Yep. And I think about that because our technicians are not leaving the, the industry. Right. They're just going to another company. Like, they're not changing their careers. Correct. And, and you talk about creating a place in which people feel valued. And here's my observation. I have met hundreds of business owners who are absolutely convinced that they've got a place where people feel valued and thousands of employees who don't feel the same way about those businesses. That's usually right. So <laughs> what, are, what are some of the, how do we invite, and, and I'm gonna ask you to really lean in courageously here to, to listen to this because you might not enjoy the answer, but what are some signals for our business owners to humbly confront that maybe they're not creating the environment that they think they are. Well, first and foremost, um, uh, have you ever gone to talk, to listen? You know, um, uh, uh, the, best, the best businesses, um, leaders will, on a semi-irregular basis, it could, you know, depending on the size of the business, it could be once a year, you know, but, but you go out to the field or you call people up and say, how are you? Just checking in, wanted to see how you're doing. Um, or what do you, tell me, about, I want to learn about your career ambitions. Like, you know, how did you find yourself in this profession? Like, where do you want to go? Like, what are your ambitions? How, how, do you have kids? Do you have a family? Tell me something about you. Do you like working here? You know, can you give me some, what, what is something that we can do better? What's something that I'm not seeing? Like, and, and some of it might be, you know, sort of helpful and some of it might not be helpful. But the point is, is you'll get information that you ordinarily wouldn't get. Um, and most important, They've probably never been asked before, yeah. ever. And so simply showing up um, to listen or take them out for lunch and, 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 and get, get their input about the business, um, what they, they're on the front line. So they actually have a lot of customer information that you don't have. Um, and so talking to them about what they're hearing, what they're seeing, that, what other business opportunities do you think they think there are. Um, listening is a big thing, but then that raises the question, how many of the people who are, who are here who are going out to the front line to listen know how to listen? Please go a little deeper here. Because, because the tendency, what, what I've watched is this exercise executed as you've described it, and then the first piece of feedback that leader gets, they say, well, that's not true. And they start defending yeah, their position. Correct. So please, a, a little insight on what this means, so, how to really listen. So when you, listening is an active, is, is active, and listening is very difficult. You know, you should be, at the end of the day of listening, you should be exhausted, right? Because you're not listening for words, you're listening for meaning. And the goal of listening is not to prove that you heard. The goal of listening is that they feel heard, right? Um, and so you don't have to agree with everything and you don't have to like everything. You have to take it in. You can ask clarifying questions. But remember, they're going to take a risk to tell you something. And if you receive it graciously, they'll tell you more and more and more. And you'll develop a relationship where honesty and truth becomes the currency. If you're defensive or you attempt to correct or, or dismiss what they say, they'll shut down and they'll tell you what you want to hear or tell you nothing. Because that's the condition you created. And so good listening sounds like this. Can you tell me, um, are there things in this business that you think that we can do better? And it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. It's their experience. And you don't have to agree. We always say that if you have an emotional response, if it makes you angry or upset, it's probably true. Mm. 
if you feel nothing about what they said, then maybe they misunderstood, but you can still take it all in, write it down and say, tell me more, go on, go on, what else? And that's basically your entire job. What else go on? And you'll walk away the list and you'll be like, I knew these things already, these things I didn't know, these things, it's just a bit of a bitch fest, that's okay, everybody has that. But you'll walk away with some information, but most importantly, they feel heard. So, I want to be really um, authentic here in this. I, I just came from a keynote where I just shared a very different message, specifically that, that listening to make people feel heard runs the risk of not actually having heard them, that we can make people feel heard without having done the listening. Hmm. And, and I just, I, I want to share that. And just, th now, if we've heard them, they should feel heard. Yes, I think, I, yes. I think I, there's... If you're, if, you're, if you're acting so that they'll feel heard... Thank you. Uh, it'll work once, twice at most, because you're still being given that information, and they're gonna, there's an expectation that you're going to do something with that information, even if it's simply reporting out here's what we heard, these three things we can address immediately, these three things are gonna take us a little more time, um, but we want you to know we heard you, and we're gonna, we're gonna work on these things. I mean, you might find out there's some really, like here's a great one that I learned recently, right? The, um, the average lifespan of a US Postal Service van um, was something like, uh, I think a year or two years, I can't remember, it's, it's, it's weirdly not very long, where the average lifespan of a UPS truck is something like five years, six yeah. years. It's like 2x, right? Two or 3x. Uh, uh, and the question is, well, what are they doing differently? The maintenance is basically the same, you know, it's, it's similar, similar drivetrains, it's all, the, all of that stuff. Um, uh, USPS washes their trucks once a week, and UPS washes their trucks every day. And how do you think somebody treats the truck when they go to work, that's their office, in a shiny new truck versus a beat up old dirty truck, right? They, they will treat it differently. And so sometimes the things that make people feel proud to go to work is like a clean t-shirt, a clean uniform, nice tools, you know? I mean, some of this stuff is really not very complicated to make people feel really proud to go to work every day. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's, uh, that was the broken windows theory in New York, where they started fixing windows in high crime neighborhoods and crime dropped. Right. Because they just felt better about where they were. Uh, it's a beautiful sentiment. So um, there's, a, there's a, a challenge here that I want to check in with. And Live TV. Indeed. And we've got a, an audience right now who is absolutely enjoying extraordinary success. I mean, they're going to see some numbers tomorrow about like, just what they're doing, but they know it as well. I mean, they're growing, they're profitable, they're in an expanding industry, and we've got private equity money rolling in at a rate that PE has said they haven't seen anything like it in you know, 30, 40 years and so forth. Why would they change course to adopt a just cause right now if winning and playing a finite game is working at this level? I mean, I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. You know, uh, the, the question is what kind of business do you want to build? Like, are you interested in building a business that makes you as rich as humanly possible? Employees be damned. And if, if the business fails when I leave, or if the PE puts so much pressure on me to make bad decisions for the company that I know it's going to destroy it, so be it. Well, I mean, that's your business. I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't do that. Right? I, I'm, I, I don't think there's a right way to build a business. The question is, what kind of business do you want to build? You know, do you want to build, build a business that serves as a legacy for you? you know, um, do, you want to, do you want to lie on your deathbed and say, I wish I made a little more money? Or do you want to lie on your deathbed and say, I, I had an impact in the lives of people, that the people who lived, who, who, who came through my company, you know, uh, made something of themselves, that they went on to build great businesses. Um, these are personal choices. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I can tell you that, 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 that people who play with a finite mindset, um, you know, 
we, we know you're playing with a finite mindset. It's very hard to build uh, trust with people around you. People, it, relationships become very transactional because when you treat people transactionally, they treat you transactionally. Like, I'm only gonna work for you if you pay me the most money, but if somebody else pays me more, I'm out of here because those are the rules you set. Um, uh, you, you know, it's, it, you, you also you, you tie your whole identity to that business or to that, to that financial return so that when, and I see this with very senior people or people who are near retirement, that when they get near the end of their career, they literally have an identity crisis because their whole identity is wrapped into a, a number or, or a business. And so without the business or without that number, without that growth, they literally don't know who they are and they go through serious, serious depression yeah. um, because they have no other interest or identity outside of that thing. So these are just choices of how people want to live their lives. And I'm not here to tell people how they live their lives, just rather that there are different ways to look at it. So imagine at this point somebody is, in fact, you know, someone who has been playing and they're recognizing through this conversation that they've been playing with a finite mindset and they're inspired, they're ready to go back and, and start to change the game that they're playing. Yep. Okay. Almost every example in the book is a new leader coming in and restoring or engaging finite mind, uh, an infinite mindset. I didn't necessarily hear a lot of stories of leaders themselves shifting from having played finite to infinite. Right. How do you do that? How do you go back to the same people you're saying winning is everything right. to and, and humble yourself and bring them on the journey with you to change course? So first of all, let's be crystal clear for the people who are freaking out at this conversation. <laughs> the infinite game is not the absence of finite games. Right. It's the context within which finite games exist. Nice. And I'll give you a real life example of someone who made a conversion. His name is Rick Elias. He's a very, very important uh, e executive and case study. Um, uh, uh, Rick, do you remember the US Airways flight that landed on the Hudson a bunch of years ago? Okay, Rick was in seat 1A. And he tells the story of the engines going out and total silence and preparing to die. And what was going through his mind was, I'm either gonna die in a horrible, fiery ball of you know, awfulness, or I'm gonna drown in the icy Hudson. That's pretty much what's gonna happen. And you go through the proverbial life flashing before your eyes and, and all of that. And the miracle was that no one died. And Rick talks about it as the greatest lesson ever because usually when people have a near-death experience where they get to learn these lessons, Usually there's survivor's guilt because there is death and destruction or there's, there's pain. And in this case, no one died, no injuries. It was the perfect lesson. Now, Rick was a finite-minded, high-flying driven executive prior who thought he was hot shit because he built a company worth $600 million. Um, and he thought he was the bee's knees, right? And you asked him if he thought if he was good and he, <laughs> he was good, right? And he recognized that he'd sacrificed relationships to make that money. He recognized that he'd sacrificed happiness and health to make that money. And um, that near-death experience transformed him to think of how he was going to build his, his business completely differently. He's still a very A-type personality. He's still very much driven to win. You know, none of that went away. But he embraced an infinite mindset. What he now knows is an infinite mindset. He and I have gotten to know each other. And um, here's what happens when you embrace an infinite mindset. His business is now worth 15 billion. Hmm. And he will say 100% that his ability to grow from 600 million to 15 billion is because he changed his mindset. If he kept that competitive mindset, he may have made an extra 100 or 200 million. So we're talking huge numbers, right? Numbers that most people will not conceive of in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in lifetimes. Um, and the irony is, is, is businesses and executives and business owners that embrace an infinite mindset almost always outperform their finite brethren. Bob Chapman being one of them who I talked about before, an infinite-minded player who just destroys his competition. They say there are three ways to transform your identity, conditioning, change environment, or a significant emotional event. Yeah. Right? And the one thing that they always say is, we highly recommend you don't wait for the significant emotional yeah. event. Yeah, don't wait for the, don't, that, don't wait to survive a plane crash. Exactly. To learn this lesson. Exactly. Yeah. And so conditioning wise, and I, I have no doubt that you're there at this point, but please 
please go read The Infinite Game. It's an extraordinary work, a truly career-altering work. So I have two last questions for you. Uh, what would be the first step, actionable step, someone could take towards finding their just cause as they walk out of here inspired? Um, I mean, literally, imagine the world that you want to live in. Like, what is the, it's, it sounds corny and cheesy, but like, what's the world you want to live in? And that just cause will influence your friends, it'll influence who you vote for, it'll influence the way you build your business, I mean, it'll, you know, it'll influence, the, influence the culture of your company, it'll influence the products you invest in and, and how you expand. I mean, um, uh, it's, it's, it sounds kind of corny. I mean, if you ask me my just cause, I imagine a world, there are those words, I imagine, right? I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. That's the world that I want to live in. And so I've committed all of my energy in my career to help build that world. I personally have taken a bet on leaders. That I've made it my choice to find, support, and celebrate the leaders that I think are more likely to build that world, because I know that I can't build it alone. It's going to take massive amounts of companies and, 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 and leadership to create that world with me. Um, uh, and so, but I'm agnostic as to the route that I take, um, but that's the world I want to live in, so that's what I've committed to, knowing full well that I'll never get there in my lifetime. And for me, uh, you inspired in, in me a just cause of ushering in a world in which when people ask how are you, they really ask, and when they answer, you really listen. I mean, that's amazing, right? And, and what I can tell you is that over the last few days, I've had hundreds of people come up to me telling me about the impact that your work has had. Wow. Hundreds of people. This is a privilege and honor for us to be here. I mean, this is just incredible. And I, I just hope uh, that, that we did the, the work to Thanks, honor your voice with this audience. It. I appreciate it. Yeah. You're very generous with your words. Thank you. But I want to underscore, listen to what his just cause was, to live in a world in which, in which people ask you how you are and mean it and, and then tell you, what was it? The, and then when you answer, answer, they really listen. And then when you answer, they really listen. That is absolutely applicable to absolutely any business here. And imagine how you treat your people differently if that's your vision. Imagine how you, what training you have to give to your people that they would treat each other and your customers so that you can build that world. The business is irrelevant. It's, it's, it's the manner in which you conduct the business that matters. Thank you. This is a, a true honor, and I can promise, I, as a, a, you know, a follower, I'm only going to be a more uh, powerful advocate for you, but the best part is that you've got, I guarantee you, 3,000 more right now. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, this was a, an honor to be here with Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.